Today, I want to talk to you about a great preacher that I think we can learn something from. And I'm speaking about Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, preacher of Victorian England. Charles Spurgeon is a man that I think um, has had some impact upon me because I've read so much of his writings. If you know anything about the online Bible commentary that I have, you'll find that I frequently quote Charles Spurgeon. He produced an enormous body of work, mostly his published sermons, and he preached on what seems to be every chapter of the Bible. Now, not literally, but he preached on many, many passages of Scripture. And it's my habit that whenever I'm going through a passage of Scripture, I will look up to see if Spurgeon preached a sermon on that passage. Spurgeon also published a couple, what you might call proper commentaries in his day, the most well-known of this is his commentary through the Psalms, a majestic work known as the Treasury of David, which when I went through the Psalms, I read every page of it. Uh, but then also, I believe it was after his death, some collected notes of his were published as a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. But most of Spurgeon's influence came from his published sermons. So I thought today it would be a good idea to take a look at the life of Charles Spurgeon and uh, sort of survey his life, and then take a look at perhaps what we can learn from him uh, as regards the work of preaching and teaching God's Word. I, I don't know where you're at. Uh, I don't know if you have any work in preaching or teaching God's Word. Uh, maybe you're a pastor, and you preach every week, you know, three times a week. Uh, maybe you're a small group leader or lead a home fellowship or a Sunday school class. Maybe you teach a women's Bible study or a men's Bible study. I, I, I don't know, but no matter what place you're in or whether or not you're a Bible teacher or preacher at all, I think there's some things that you can learn from the example of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was converted on January 6th, 1850, when he was 15 and a half years old. Spurgeon was raised in a Christian home. Both his grandparents and his parents were believers. Uh, his mother actually gave birth to 17 children, but nine of those 17 died in infancy, which again was fairly common in those days. Uh, I, I recall reading in so many of Spurgeon's sermons when he talks about the death of a child or an infant, he, he speaks of it as something that nearly every family would know intimately, and again, for good reason, back in those days. Uh, he was converted as he wandered into a primitive Methodist church on a snowy winter day on a Sunday in January. Again, January 6th, the day that we have mentioned before. Spurgeon said that it was as cold inside the church as it was outside the church, and uh, that there were only about 13 people in attendance. Again, the I don't know if it was a, normally a large church, but you could see just from the seating of the church as illustrated in the picture that's up on the screen right now, I mean, it's a church that would hold m more than 100 people, I would suppose, but on that particular morning, because of the severe snowstorm, there were much fewer people in attendance, uh, only 13 people, and so much so that the regular preacher didn't even show up. So there they are waiting for the 11 o'clock service. I don't know how early Spurgeon got there, but he gets in there. He sits down, a young man, 15 and a half years old. He's one of about 13 people in attendance. 11 o'clock comes, the time when the service is supposed to start, and the preacher, the pastor of this primitive Methodist church doesn't show up. Now, maybe I should explain just a little bit about the primitive Methodist movement in that day. Uh, of course, you uh, have heard of the Methodists, probably that church that was in some ways uh, founded as a legacy of the work of John Wesley and others, of course. Uh, but the primitive Methodists were those who decided to get back to the roots of Methodism, thus the name primitive Methodist. And uh, they were the hallelujah group. They were what we might consider in some ways, not in regard to spiritual gifts, but in regard to enthusiasm. They were the uh, holy rollers of that day. Lots of hallelujahs, lots of shouting, lots of just simple people really loving Jesus in an exuberant way. So, 
when the regular preacher did not show up, at 11.05, a nameless deacon took charge of the service. He said, well, it's five minutes after. Nobody else is here. And the deacon preached on this text, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I am supposing that it was somewhat of a spontaneous uh, message. It, it seems that he didn't really know exactly that the preacher wasn't going to show up. So maybe it's a verse he had heard about, spoken about before, but he chose that verse, Isaiah 45, verse 22, look unto me and be ye saved all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And Spurgeon said that the man preached for about 10 minutes and he was so simple in his preaching that is, he was untrained. He was just a deacon of the church. He didn't have any formal education in ministry. <laughs> Spurgeon said he was so simple that he had to stick to his text. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing. All he could do was keep repeating Isaiah 45, 22 and looking at the different words and phrases of the text and talking about them. And Spurgeon went on to describe uh, in many ways uh, what happened to him on that day. Uh, this comes from one of Spurgeon's sermons or writings, although I do want to stress here that according to some people, Charles Spurgeon told the story of his conversion more than 280 times in his recorded sermons. Now, he had said something, you know, almost 3,000 sermons, so it was about 8% of his preached sermons, but again, according to one person's count, he often shared his testimony. And this is one rendering of it, again, found in one of Spurgeon's sermons or writings. He says this, I had been wandering about seeking rest and finding none till a plain, unlettered lay preacher among the primitive Methodists stood up in the pulpit and gave out this passage as his text, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. He had not much to say, thank God, for that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. And there was nothing needed, by me at any rate, except his text. I remember how he said, It is Christ that speaks. I am in the garden in agony, pouring out my soul unto death. I am on the tree, dying for sinners. Look unto me. Look unto me. That is all you have to do. A child can look. One who is almost an idiot can look. However weak or however poor a man may be, he can look. And if he looks, the promise is that he shall live. Again, very vivid recollection of what that sermon was all about and the main themes of that sermon. You can just picture this uh, this simple deacon of this primitive left Methodist church repeating it over and over again and applying it. Uh, this is Christ speaking to us today. Now, let me continue on because here... Spurgeon is going to describe how the preacher got very personal with him. Uh, check it out here, sort of in the last third of what we've been looking at here. It says, Then, stopping, he pointed to where I was sitting under the gallery, and he said, That young man there looks very miserable. I expect that I did, for that is how I felt. Then he said, There's no hope for you, young man, or any chance of getting rid of your sin, but by looking to Jesus. And he shouted, as I think only a primitive Methodist can, look, look, young man, look now. And I did look. Well, again, very dramatically, very wonderfully, uh, Spurgeon describing uh, the message, the experience of the conversion. Uh, a man preached simply from a text, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. He brought it home in application to an individual who needed it so much, and that individual, of course, was Charles Spurgeon. And even though he was raised in a Christian home, he had not yet truly trusted Christ for his salvation. Um, you could say in an adult way, as a grown-up person. I, I'm sure that he had a child's faith as appropriate for a child, but just like everybody, he had to come to the place where he had an adult faith, and that was his experience. January 6th in the year 1850. Now, Let's talk about Spurgeon's early ministry, because within a year or so, in 1851, 
He preached for the first time when he was 16 years old. The the story of Spurgeon's first sermon is interesting. At least it's interesting to me, and I'll kind of give it to you from memory. The pastor of the church where he was attending knew of what we would call a home Bible study. You know, it was a little cottage church out in the country, a little cottage Bible study. And uh, the pastor of that church sent Spurgeon and another young man out to go lead that, what well, again, we would call today a home Bible study, a home group, go lead it on this particular day at this time. So Spurgeon is walking out there with the other young man, and, and the pastor, intentionally or not, I really don't know, the pastor never told which one of the two young men was going to preach. So as they're walking there, Spurgeon says to his friend, so what are you going to teach on today? And his friend said, I'm not preaching. I thought you were going to preach. And Spurgeon said, okay, I'll do it. And so he spoke at that little, uh, well, again, we would call it a cottage church, a, a home Bible study there. I believe the village was called Water Beach. That's later where he became a pastor for the first time. And uh, it was blessed. Nothing dramatic, but it was blessed. People could see that there was an anointing, that there was a blessing on that young 16-year-old man. Well, um, he, in that very same year, at 16 years of age, he became pastor at Water Beach Chapel in Cambridgeshire. And he began to gain a name for himself at Water Beach. People came from miles to hear this young, eloquent, passionate maturely intelligent pastor who preached thoroughly biblical theology. And at that age, Spurgeon looked even younger than he was. I mean, look, let's face it. He was, you know, 16, 17 years old, uh, but he looked maybe 13, 14. He had something of a baby face. And so three years later, in the year 1854, Charles Spurgeon was called to come to New Park Street in London, again, at that tender age of 19 years of age. He was called by the congregation, again, of the New Park Street Chapel. Uh, They invited young Spurgeon to come initially for a six-month trial period. But Spurgeon, even though he was young, even though he was inexperienced, he had a wisdom about him. Uh, When you look at the young Spurgeon, you just say, that is a young-looking man. He does have something of a baby face. And and Spurgeon wisely said, well, you guys are asking me to come for a six-month trial period. How about this? I'll come for uh, three months. Because if the congregation doesn't really like me, if it doesn't really fit, I don't want to be a hindrance to what God is doing here. Now, New Park Street Church was a church that uh, at one time was a very prominent church in London, uh, but it had over the years fallen on what we might call hard times. It wasn't thriving. It wasn't prosperous. It was a struggling congregation. But when young Charles Spurgeon, 19 years of age, came to that church, uh, it was remarkable. It was something electric. Two weeks after he started his pastorate in London, a man gave the following prophecy regarding Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, uh, he spoke these words, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't recall whether or not he spoke these words directly to Charles Spurgeon or to other people, but a, a man said predictively regarding Spurgeon just two weeks after he came to the New Park Street Chapel, that young man will live to be the greatest preacher of this or any other age. He will bring more souls to Christ than any man who ever proclaimed the gospel except for the Apostle Paul. His name will be known everywhere and his sermons will be translated into many of the languages of the world. Well, I could say that at least as concerns the English-speaking world, uh, that was true of Charles Spurgeon. So there he comes as a young man to uh, London, Uh, He's married shortly thereafter. By the year 1856, he's married uh, just a couple years within that of coming to London. Uh, But then also in 1856, just a couple years after coming to London, uh, there was a notable tragedy in his life and his ministry. Some people call it the Surrey Gardens Music Hall tragedy. You see, 
Spurgeon was packing out the new Park Street pulpit. There were far more people who wanted to come and hear him preach and be part of the church than they could fit within the building. And so um, in October 1856, they decided to start having their weekly services at what was called the Royal Surrey Gardens Music Hall. It was a, you know, a facility that people could rent or hire as, as they could. And that hall held up to 12,000 people. And since this was the initial service with this young man who was really catching London by storm with his preaching and with his pastoral ability, that first night, October 19th, 1856, the the place was packed. 12,000 people the music hall held and there were 12,000 people in there. And it said that there were 10,000 more people outside in the gardens. Now, the, the service just began underway. And you can just imagine everything flooding through Spurgeon's mind. Here he is, he's a young man. He's in his young 20s. What well, he's about 21 at this time. And, and there he is speaking to thousands of people and having all this responsibility upon him. That service is just underway when, during Spurgeon's opening prayer, or his prayer before the sermon, there were troublemakers in the crowd. And they started shouting, fire! The galleries, or the balconies, we would say, the balconies are giving way. And a panic swept through the crowd. People started rushing for the exits. There was a stampede, and seven people died and 28 more were hospitalized with serious injuries. Charles Spurgeon was totally undone. That night, he was literally carried from the platform and taken to a friend's house where he remained for several days in an unbelievably deep depression. Later, he said this, quote, Perhaps never a soul went so near the burning furnace of insanity and yet came away unharmed. In other words, he said, this almost drove me crazy. Um, it was a unbelievable tragedy and stress to put on any pastor or preacher. But a 21-year-old man, uh, that's quite a thing. But Spurgeon recognized years later how God used it. This is what Spurgeon said years later about the Surrey Royal, uh, the Royal Gardens at Surrey Music Hall. Uh, He said this, quote, but how much of the success with which God has crowned our ministry has been due to the most afflicting providence that ever befell a Christian minister or a Christian church? Was it not, dear friends, to allude to that sad event. And again, he's talking about the uh, Royal Gardens at Surrey Music Hall. He said, to allude to that sad event, which is still upon the minds of some of us and will be till we die, when the cry was raised and death came into the midst of our solemn assembly, was it not due to that, to a very great extent, that the preacher became known and that so he has had an opportunity of speaking to many more souls than otherwise would have listened to him concerning the unsearchable riches of Christ. Spurgeon spoke those words in a sermon titled, Dark Clouds and Bright Blessings. And what he's simply saying is that, yes, this was an awful tragedy, a terrible tragedy. Nevertheless, God used it and has seen us through even such a great affliction. Well, of course, Spurgeon, in some ways at least, got over it, and he continued to preach in the great public buildings of London. Again, the uh, New Park Street Chapel was just too small. So they met at Exeter Hall, Surrey Gardens Music Hall, the Agriculture Hall, and the Crystal Palace. By the age of 23, he had preached to crowds of more than 23,000 people. And again, at the Crystal Palace, he preached to 24,000 people. Now, the the story goes, and look, some of these stories about Charles Spurgeon, you you don't always know, but he was going to preach to almost 24,000 people at the Crystal Palace in London. 
Spurgeon went there the day before or a few days before and he did a sound check. I mean, remember, he spoke to that many people without any amplification. In those days, you couldn't be a preacher to very many people unless you could really project your voice in a powerful way. And so Spurgeon wanted to get an idea of the acoustics of the room. So he went there and he went up on the platform and he started booming out over the empty Crystal Palace Hall. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he just repeated it several times. Well, he thought the hall was empty, but there was a workman bent down working on some seats that needed repair were broken or something. That workman, hearing Spurgeon just say those words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came under deep conviction and he was later uh, saved in a wonderful, wonderful way. Well, um, again, you could click through the events of Spurgeon's life. In the year 1861, the Metropolitan Tabernacle was built. Um, that picture there is of Spurgeon preaching at Exeter Hall. Um, but eventually, in 1861, um, the Metropolitan Tabernacle was opened. Uh, Spurgeon was already married by that time. The Surrey Gardens tragedy had happened. The Metropolitan Tabernacle, a church building that still exists, although it's been burned down, I think, twice, but at the same location and in roughly the same style, at least on the exterior of the building, it still sits there. In Spurgeon's day, it seated five to 6,000 people. That church opened in 1861, and that was the start of 30 more years of ministry for Charles Spurgeon in that building. Again, the uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle was built after this classical style. And, uh, of course, the interior of the building uh, had many galleries. And, uh, again, five or 6,000 people could hear him preach in that particular building. Spurgeon was famous for many things, but he was mostly famous as a preacher. He was a compelling and dramatic speaker. Uh, as his friend John Carlyle remembered, uh, he was dramatic to his fingertips. Now, there are drawings and even a few photographs from this period that show Spurgeon uh, assuming dramatic stances. Some of these pictures would compare him to the more sedate kind of Anglican Church of England preacher. Um, Spurgeon was full of fire uh, in that he would preach with, with big gestures and with sort of a dramatic stance. The visitors who came to the Metropolitan Tabernacle tell us that he seemed to act out the parts, that he would assume the identity of the biblical characters that he spoke of. And uh, before age and gout slowed him down, because later in his life, Spurgeon suffered painfully from gout. But before that slowed him down, Spurgeon would pace the platform and sometimes even uh, jog a little bit from side to side. Uh, there were cartoons in newspapers and magazines that would compare Spurgeon to the classic, you might say, boring English preacher of the day. And then there were other cartoons that should have shored him as the uh, young lion of the pulpit and then comparing him to a Church of England or Anglican uh, preacher who was, it's kind of like a funny old woman of the pulpit. Uh, still, there was another cartoon that showed uh, Spurgeon as driving the uh, fast train, uh, named the Spurgeon. He's driving a fast train while the Church of England, the old Anglican pastor, is on the slow coach. But, you know, Spurgeon there, he's modern. He's up with it. He's ready for what he's going to do. It, it is said that in the preparation for his sermons, uh, Spurgeon wrote them out. But that's not what he took with him into the pulpit. It seems that in his preparation, and I, I'll be honest with you, I've read a few conflicting things about this, so I'll give you at least one understanding of it. Spurgeon would, in his preparation, write out his sermons, but normally he would only take one page of notes into the pulpit. Yet, when he spoke... He spoke at a rate of 140 words per minute, and most of his sermons were around 40 minutes. And remember that he preached to those audiences of sometimes more 
than 23,000 people without a microphone or without any kind of mechanical amplification. One thing that really marked the preaching of Charles Spurgeon, and I think something that we can learn from him, and I'll get to some of those points. We'll leave that for a little bit in the end. Spurgeon was a man of great passion in his service of God, especially you would say that Charles Spurgeon was a passionate preacher. I like what he said in a uh, sermon titled Seeing and Testifying. Spurgeon said this, Why some sermons hang like icicles upon the lips of the speaker, but the apostles preached as if they were all on fire. Their lips were like the mouth of a volcano when it emits, when it vomits lava. Every word burnt its way into the hearts and consciences of men. Never talk coldly of Christ who was on fire with love to you. Preach the gospel ardently. Again, that's a great thing and a great uh, sort of uh, attitude of Spurgeon in his preaching. If you're going to listen, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with my energy. I'm going to do it with zeal. And I would have to say this too. Spurgeon loved to preach. Now, I don't think that that makes him terribly unusual among preachers. Listen, uh, I love to preach. I I won't say each and every time I get up to preach, I love it. But in the main, in the whole, I love talking to people about God's word. And I I know hundreds of pastors who would say the same thing. But Charles Spurgeon would be among those. He loved to preach. So much so that I found in one of his sermons, it was a sermon titled The Servants and the Pounds. uh, He said that he thought God would give him the gift of preaching into eternity. Let me show you that particular quote. This is what Spurgeon said, again, in a sermon titled, The Servants and the Pounds. Spurgeon said this, It may also be, but I do not know, and so I cannot tell you, that we are in future dispensations to fill unto other worlds much the same office as angels fill in ours. Jesus hath made us kings and priests, and we are in training for our thrones. What if in this congregation I am learning to proclaim my master's glory to myriads of worlds? Possibly the preacher who is faithful here may yet be made to tell forth his Lord's glory to constellations at a time. What if one might stand on a central star and preach Christ to worlds on worlds instead of preaching him to these two galleries and this area. Why not? At any rate, if I should ever gain a voice loud enough to be heard for millions of miles, I would speak none other than those glorious truths which the Lord has revealed in Christ Jesus. (laughs) What a great thought. Spurgeon's thinking, I'm going to be preaching to the stars, to worlds beyond. Uh, the great truths of Jesus Christ and God's word. Charles Spurgeon was, of course, mostly known as a preacher, but he did have a great worldwide ministry uh, that went beyond his preaching work. Now, some of it was connected. Uh, He had a weekly published sermon that went out every week to sometimes hundreds of thousands of people and weekly published in newspapers in the United States and other places as well. Uh, Many of his books were very effective and widespread. Uh, By 1855, uh, Spurgeon's sermons started weekly publication. By 1865, his sermons sold more than 25,000 copies every week. And they were translated into more than 20 languages. Spurgeon's sermons were distributed widely and published in newspapers. And they were collected and published in volumes there were 63 volumes of a total of 3,561 sermons. Now, you can get it all digitally now today. Uh, you know, and I have both. I have both sermons, Spurgeon's, in digital format. Of course, you can find them online as well. But you can also get them in print if you want them there. Uh, God used those Spurgeon's, uh, Spurgeon's, those sermons of Charles Spurgeon. Uh, one woman was converted through reading a single page of one of Spurgeon's sermons wrapped around some butter that she had bought, and Spurgeon's books sold into the multiple millions over the years. Now, Spurgeon died in the year 1892 at 57 years of age. 
that's relatively young. I mean, e even for that day and age, it was a relatively young time to die. He died so young because of many years of poor health. Uh, and the poor health had several causes, but one of them was the stress and discouragement of the controversies that he had to face. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, let me now talk to you about six ways that I think that Charles Spurgeon was an example to preachers. Okay, six ways. We'll work through these. First of all, Spurgeon showed that God can use unexpected servants. Let me just tell you simply, I think Charles Spurgeon was an unexpected servant for God to use. He was unexpected because of his background. Uh, he was unexpected because of his youth. He didn't come from a high class background. He came from a very simple background. God started using him as a young man. Um, and even with his first teaching in the story I told you before, he, he didn't really know that he was going to preach. And so it's obvious that he was gifted. It's obvious that he had a real vital relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was gifted to do the ministry that he did. Nevertheless, if you just looked at that young man and his background, you would consider him to be a very unexpected man to be the greatest preacher to date in the English language. But I'll tell you another reason why it was unexpected that God would so use Charles Spurgeon. And I would say it was because of his lack of formal education. Uh, Spurgeon never really went to college. He certainly didn't go to seminary. Uh, he was an educated man, but not formally. He was self-taught. It's an interesting story that as a young man, Spurgeon missed being admitted to college because he went for an interview with the college president for admission to the college. And the servant girl of the home or the offices, whatever, of where he came, the servant girl accidentally showed him into a different room than of the principal of the college who was waiting to interview him. So the principal's sitting in one room. The servant girl leads Spurgeon into another room. And there's the principal saying, well, when's this young man going to come and speak to me about admission? And so they never got together. Now, when the whole thing was kind of discovered, oh, it was a big mistake. Spurgeon determined not to reapply for admission. He believed that God spoke to him from Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5. And I'll read it to you in the King James. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. You know, Spurgeon said, for whatever reason, God doesn't have that path for me to be educated for ministry through traditional channels. And so again, he never went to college, never went to seminary. By the standards of his own day, much less ours, he was not formally educated for ministry. That made him unexpected. And I'll say something else about Charles Spurgeon. His great work for God's kingdom as a preacher was unexpected because he was never even formally ordained. He refused the title reverend. He would only take the title pastor. Not only was he not educated for him, he was never even formally ordained. So friends, take comfort in that. Uh, Spurgeon shows that God can use unexpected servants. If you feel you're like the kind of person, well, I don't know if God can use you. Listen, maybe you're in a good spot with that. God loves to use the unexpected. Now, every once in a while, God will sneak one in and use an expected kind of, you think, well, no wonder God used them. But I think that God likes to use unexpected servants. It's a way that more and more glory goes unto the Lord. All right, that's number one. Spurgeon showed that God can use unexpected servants. Uh, here's number two. Spurgeon showed the value of focus and the ability to think through a text for preaching. Uh, Charles Spurgeon knew how to break down a text and examine it. He had wonderful analytical and meditative skills. Um, Spurgeon could look at a text and break it down. Now, I don't know if you've ever had any training in what is sometimes called the inductive Bible study method, uh, but it's a study method that begins with observation. 
observation, interpretation, application. I mean, there's more steps that people bring to it, but those are the three basic steps. Observation, interpretation, application. Spurgeon was brilliant in his ability to simply observe what's in the text. He knew how to examine it. He knew how to do something that I think is critical in preaching preparation, in studying a text for preaching. He knew how to see what's there. There's a great story about Spurgeon, how he could and did pick up on another man's preaching midway and continue the sermon along. There's a story about Spurgeon's grandfather, who was also a preacher. Spurgeon's grandfather uh, was at a church where Spurgeon was supposed to come and preach. And Spurgeon was late. Traffic in London had kept him up and he wasn't able to get there on time. So his grandfather began preaching because they didn't know when Spurgeon would show up. Let's remember back in those days, they couldn't break out the cell phone and make the call. So his grandfather started preaching, and he was about uh, a third of the way, midway through his sermon, when Charles Spurgeon walked into the church. Hey, everybody, I'm here. This is what Spurgeon's grandfather told his grandson, Charles Spurgeon. He said this, Grandson, this is my text, and I've just finished my second point. Spurgeon went up, looked at the text, and started preaching on without missing a beat from what his grandfather was saying. And later on, people were amazed at this, and Spurgeon said, well, just look at the text. You can see that it breaks down very neatly into four points. My grandfather told me they just finished the first two, so I knew exactly where to pick it up. But again, that comes just from the ability to focus in on the text and think through it, just carefully observe what is there. Now, Charles Spurgeon did not preach verse by verse through books of the Bible. And as I mentioned to you before, he only wrote two proper commentaries, and I think one of them was published after his death. But he knew how to preach from a verse or two in a thoroughly expositional manner. Now, to my observation, I would say that maybe in 30 to 40 percent of Spurgeon's sermons, the text is basically a launching point. In other words, the text is something that just gets him started. It just suggests an opening thought. But I'll tell you, again, this is just my rough estimation. In 60 to 70 percent of Spurgeon's sermons, his sermons are a true and often brilliant exposition of the verse or two that he used as a text for preaching. And I want you to understand as well that his work as a Bible expositor wasn't limited to the sermon. As part of their normal services, Spurgeon would regularly do a scripture reading with a running exposition of the passage before he preached his Sunday sermon. He did expositions on selections from 57 out of the 66 books of the Bible. So, yes, he preached, and many of his sermons were brilliant expositional sermons, even though he didn't preach verse by verse in books of the Bible. But he did running commentary through many portions of many of the books of the Bible. Now, let me give you an example of Spurgeon's ability to think through a text. It can be found in his sermon, Jacob's Fear and Faith. Uh, He preached that sermon on a Thursday evening, June 21st, in the year 1877. By the way, that was two days after his 43rd birthday. His text for that sermon was Genesis chapter 32, verses 11 and 12. And so this is how he opened his sermon, by reading that text. Of course, he would have used the King James Bible, and this is the text, Genesis chapter 32, verses 11 and 12. Spurgeon said this. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Okay, so do you kind of have that text in mind a little bit? Spurgeon is quoting what Jacob said to the Lord right before he was going to meet his brother Esau. 
So that's why he titled the sermon, Jacob's Fear and Faith. By the way, you also see on the cover let, on the cover page of this sermon, at least in the electronic version, this was sermon number 2,817. And uh, that means there was only about 700 sermons yet to be published for by Spurgeon. The, the other thing I want you to see in this is that uh, in this title page, it says that this sermon was intended for reading on the Lord's Day, February 8th, 1903. Uh, that was more than 10 years after the death of Spurgeon. Uh, Charles Spurgeon had such a backlog of sermons that were unpublished that uh, the publishing work of his sermons went on for many years after his death. Okay, so what does Spurgeon do in this particular sermon? Well, first he has an introduction. And in his introduction, he spoke of Jacob as a clever bargaining man with good business sense. And then he brings us to the whole scene of Jacob at the brook Jabbok. You can imagine how beautifully he paints the scene, how dramatically. And then he explains that the text, uh, that Genesis passage, is Jacob's plea to God for help in the meeting that he was going to have in es with Esau the next day. And he explains that the text was Jacob's prayer before he wrestled with God. Now, what I find interesting is that the prayer begins at Genesis chapter 32, verse 9, but for some reason... Spurgeon only chose the last two verses of that prayer. And this was for the Thursday evening prayer meeting. So his sermon was only going to have two points. It was probably a shorter message. And uh, his sermon basically had two points. Number one, Jacob's fear. And number two, Jacob's faith. So first, in examining Jacob's fear, this is what Spurgeon noted. Uh, Jacob in his fear is not held up as an example. Just another, we shouldn't be afraid in the same way that Jacob was. Uh, Jacob's fear was wrong because it followed a great deliverance. God had just delivered him. Uh, Jacob's fear was wrong because the angels of God had just met him. Jacob's fear probably arose from remembering his old sins. But Jacob's fear in some ways was a good thing because it led him to prayer. Another good thing about his fear was that it led him to take a review of his life. And then a third good thing from Jacob's fear was that it led him to seek out the promise that was most suitable to his case. In other words, Lord, I need your help. Um, you've promised me things. I'm going to select the promise that's most suitable. And again, Spurgeon develops these points in a wonderful, beautiful, spontaneous way through the preaching of the message. But listen, you or I could preach this message. You or I could take that text and these points and do something with that. Okay, now, uh, number two, the second point of the sermon has to do with Jacob's faith. Number one, Jacob's faith was based on God's promise. Uh, number two, the prayer started with referring to God's promise, and then it ended with referring to God's promise. He's just making a simple observation about the text there. But then he also observes that Jacob's faith was what he called a struggling faith. It was a mixture between I fear Esau and for you have said. And that gave Spurgeon the opportunity to speak about people who struggle with their faith. So again, that one message, Jacob's faith and fear, uh, preached in what was the year 1887 or something like that. Um, in that I really think that's just one illustration among thousands of how Spurgeon showed the value of focus and the ability to think through a text for preaching. Friends, I just want you to think about that. I want you to think about how important it is for you to come together with the Bible and observe it carefully to think of what the biblical text says. Uh, let your skills of observation in the Bible become stronger and stronger. And Spurgeon is a great example of that. I, I'd like to think that Spurgeon has taught me at least a little bit about that. B because I, I would say, well, Spurgeon, I never saw that. Look at that. But it's right there. W we can do the same thing by honing our skills of observation. Okay, that's number two. God used him unexpected. That's number one. Um, he was a man of focused and great skills of observation in his preaching. Number three, uh, Spurgeon showed how to preach to the common man and the common woman. You know, Spurgeon was a preacher 
for the people. Now, you and I read Spurgeon's sermons today, and, and I have to admit, if you read Spurgeon's sermons today, they are something of an acquired taste. In other words, modern audiences can be put off regarding Spurgeon's sermons. It's like, whoa, this is Victorian English. There's a lot of these and thous. Wherever he's using lots of words I don't normally use. Uh, what's going on with this? But I want you to understand this. In Spurgeon's day, he was very well known for speaking to the common man. You, you and I read it, and we think he's trying to speak to, you know, people who study Shakespeare. But in his day, Spurgeon was um, sometimes loved and sometimes hated because he spoke to the common people. He understood the importance of it. He said this in one sermon of his. He said, I feel sure that God will bless London yet, because at this very moment, if the gospel is preached so that people can understand it, they will throng to hear it. Alas, poor men cannot understand half the preachers. They preach Latin fit for drawing rooms. If they would go to Billingsgate and learn English, they might get on. You say, well, that would be very rough English. Well, but the roughest of English might be better than the Latinized jargon of most of our pulpits. When men preach the gospel plainly and simply, they will never lack a congregation in this great city. I am certain of it. I am sure that the Lord has as much people in this city because there is a hungering and thirsty after the gospel if they could but get at it. You see, Spurgeon was passionate about speaking to common people. And friends, we read Spurgeon today and we think, oh, how eloquent he is. Oh, how he can turn to praise. And listen, there, there is a true eloquence in Spurgeon's preaching. But he wasn't trying to be eloquent. He was trying to speak to the everyday man, to the everyday woman. May I say that is a fantastic example for us. When Spurgeon came uh, to the new Park Street Baptist Church, his preaching found an immediate audience. But many in the press went at war with him. There was a newspaper called the Ipswich Express. They said that Spurgeon's sermons were uh, redolent, full of bad taste, vulgar, and theatrical. In other words, they were criticizing the fact that he spoke to the common man. Now, let me say, they said that his sermons were vulgar. Please understand this. Vulgar in a Victorian sense doesn't mean crude or nasty at all. You know, we talk about some being vulgar today, and we might think they're speaking with a little bit of obscenity. No, that wasn't it at all. In Victorian vocabulary, Vulgar simply meant to speak to the common man and woman in terms they could understand. It meant that you did not speak in a rarefied, upper-class style of English. And when Spurgeon read of this accusation from this newspaper, he speaks in vulgar, uh, bad taste, and a theatrical way. This is what Spurgeon replied. He said, I am perhaps vulgar, but it isn't intentional, save that I must and will make the people listen. My firm conviction is that we have had quite enough polite preachers and many require a change. God has owned me among the degraded and offcasts. Let others serve their class. These are mine and to them I must keep. I'll tell you, there's something beautiful about that, something powerful about Spurgeon's Security. You see, remember, Spurgeon wasn't formally educated, but he wasn't insecure about it in his preaching. He, he didn't think, oh, I got to try to sound smart. I got to try to sound intellectual. Look, he, he preached just from his own person, from his own personality. And that's number three. He showed the importance and the value of preaching to the common man, to the common woman. 
Uh, let's take a look at a third characteristic of Sir Spurgeon as a preacher that we can learn from. Uh, number four, Spurgeon showed how to tenaciously hold to beliefs without becoming a jerk. I kind of want to apologize for the phrasing of that particular statement, uh, but I just couldn't think of a better term to say than just becoming a jerk. You know, becoming somebody who's obnoxious and offensive and you just don't want to listen to and is just trying to irritate you and annoy you. Now, make no mistake about it. Charles Spurgeon tenaciously held to his beliefs. But especially on many controversial issues, he was able to do it with a really wonderful spirit. Spurgeon understood himself to be a five-point Calvinist. And he stood up for those beliefs when not many people did. Okay, so make no mistake about it. Unapologetically, Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist. And he sometimes said that Calvinism is the gospel and the gospel is Calvinism. I mean, he believed that. Yet, he was also not Calvinistic enough for some of his critics. Thus, there was a newspaper in those days, uh, a religious newspaper, called The World Newspaper. It reported that Mr. Spurgeon is nominally a Calvinist. They said he was a Calvinist in name only. He wasn't a real Calvinist. And he was rejected by many of the high Calvinistic churches. For example, the pastor of the Surrey Chapel uh, spent time every Sunday criticizing Spurgeon's sermon from the previous week. Why? Because it wasn't Calvinistic enough. At the same time, Spurgeon was certainly not popular among Arminian, Armenian, I should say, circles, because he was far too Calvinistic for them. So the Wesleyans uh, understand he's too Calvinistic for us, but the high Calvinists said he's not Calvinistic enough for us. But overall, Charles Spurgeon just didn't care. He was passionate about biblical theology, but he didn't feel compelled to organize it according to a comprehensive systematic theology. Spurgeon once said that angels might write and understand a systematic theology, but you and I, we should just stick to our Bibles. Therefore, Though he strongly held to what he believed were Calvinistic beliefs, Spurgeon held them in a way that put the scriptures first. And Charles Spurgeon loved and appreciated those in the body of Christ who disagreed with him if they also took the Bible seriously. Let, let me show you something that S Spurgeon uh, spoke in a sermon. He preached this on one occasion. I am myself persuaded that the Calvinist alone is right upon some points, and the Arminian is alone right on others. There is a great deal of truth in the positive side of both systems and a great deal of error in the negative side of both systems. If I were asked, why is a man damned? I should answer as an Arminian answers. He destroys himself. I should not dare to lay man's ruin at the door of divine sovereignty. On the other hand, if I were asked, why is a man saved? I could only give the Calvinistic answer. He is saved through the sovereign grace of God and not at all of himself. <laughs> well, to that, I give a hearty amen. Why is a man damned? I'll give you the Arminian answer. Why is a man saved? I'll give you a more Calvinistic answer. You see, even though I don't consider myself a Calvinist, uh, I could find disagreement with different aspects of Reformed theology for sure. Uh, I would have very much the same opinion. I would agree wholeheartedly with what Spurgeon said in that quote. Let me give you another quote from another sermon of Charles Spurgeon. This one was from a sermon titled The Way of Wisdom. He said this, When a Calvinist says that all things happen according to the predestination of God, he speaks the truth. And I'm willing to be called a Calvinist. But when an Arminian says that when a man sins, the sin is his own, and that if he continues in sin and perishes, his eternal damnation will lie entirely at his own door. I believe that he also speaks the truth, though I'm not willing to be called an Arminian. The fact is, there is some truth in both these systems of theology. Again, what I want you to see is that even though Spurgeon was a 
strong, a staunch Calvinist. He did, especially in the more mature, mature years of his ministry, he definitely valued a biblical theology and he knew how to see good in systems of theology that he disagreed with. Um, let me give you one more quote. Um, again, this is one from a sermon titled Heart Disease Curable. Spurgeon said this, We had better far be inconsistent with ourselves than with the inspired word. I have been called an Arminian Calvinist or a Calvinistic Arminian, and I am quite content so long as I can keep close to my Bible. Friends, all I could say, that is something that I could say amen to. When Spurgeon preached on a so-called Calvinistic passage, man, he seems full-on Calvinistic. When he preached on a so-called Arminian passage, uh, you might think he was Arminian. Again, just to clarify, he believed in letting the Bible speak for itself, and he knew how to hold firm to his beliefs without becoming a jerk. There's a prayer that's attributed to Charles Spurgeon. Now, I've never found it confirmed. I've searched through different writings and accounts. I've never found it confirmed. It might be out there, but I've never seen it. But there's a prayer attributed to Spurgeon that shows the same kind of heart. It said that on one occasion, Spurgeon prayed this from the pulpit. Lord, hasten to bring in all your elect and then elect some more. I think that's a wonderfully broad, big heart for God's work in this world. All right, that was number four. Uh, Spurgeon knew how to hold, to hold to his beliefs without being a jerk about it. Here's a related idea, number five, something that preachers should take into consideration. Number five, Spurgeon was loved and adored. He was also hated, mocked, and attacked. Listen, you might think that this man who was such a famous preacher uh, in London and in all the English-speaking world, beyond the English-speaking world, since so much of his work was translated in his own day, you might think that he was universally loved. No. Now, he was obviously appreciated by many people, but there were many others who hated him. I suppose uh, that there were some secular people who hated him, such as some of the media of his day, and even Karl Marx hated Charles Spurgeon. D did you know that Karl Marx and Spurgeon were in London at the same time? And Marx complained about Spurgeon to his associate, Friedrich Engels. Uh, so he was opposed by secular people. That doesn't surprise us. But friends, uh, he was also hated and opposed by many fellow Christians. He was hated and opposed by some fellow Christians because he was a Calvinist. So some Arminians criticized Spurgeon. Because he was a sensible Calvinist, some hyper-Calvinists criticized Spurgeon. Because he was low church and spoke against ceremonialism, some high church, you might call them ceremonially oriented reverends, criticized Spurgeon. Because he insisted on certain doctrinal standards, Toward the end of his life, many of his fellow Baptists criticized Spurgeon and disowned him even. The downgrade controversy of his later years broke his heart. And listen, I don't have any doubt that there were many people, many fellow pastors and preachers who hated Charles Spurgeon out of pure jealousy. They hated him because he was successful, because he had a wide hearing and a big impact. Now, in some of his sermons, uh, Spurgeon gave advice on how to handle criticism. Here's a few quotes uh, from a sermon that he did on the book of Daniel. Um, Spurgeon said this, Be ready for a bad name. Be willing to be called a bigot. Be prepared for the loss of friendships. Be prepared for anything so long as you can stand fast by him who bought you with his precious blood. And then in another time, Spurgeon said this, A Christian man should be willing to be tried. He should be willing to let his religion be put to the test. There, says he, hammer away if you like. Do you want to be carried to heaven on a feather bed? <laughs> wow, what a statement. 
I mean, listen, how challenging. It's as if Spurgeon says, I faced a lot of criticism, a lot of opposition, but it just goes with the territory. I don't expect to be carried to heaven on a feather bed. Now, friends, I got to say that this is convicting to me. Um, there are times when I find myself expecting that I should be carried to heaven on a feather bed, and I resent any kind of opposition or difficulty or trouble, and we just shouldn't have that attitude. You, you could even say that Spurgeon was able to have a good attitude when he was mocked. One more quote from that same sermon. I love this one. Spurgeon said this, I have sometimes thought when I have had seen a good joke cracked over my poor head that there's so much misery in the world that if I might be the cause of making it a little more mirth, making a little more mirth, I should be glad. And even if it told against me, if, I, if it made somebody feel a little merrier, it was not a matter for great sorrow. Do you understand what Spurgeon was saying there? Spurgeon basically said, yeah, look, I know a lot of people make fun of me, but there's a lot of misery in this world. And so if it can make people laugh in this miserable world, then okay, maybe it's not so bad. Let me tell you, friends, that is a great attitude to have. And this um, is our sixth point. The last one was Spurgeon was loved and adored. He was also hated, mocked, and attacked. Our sixth thing that we can take away, and this will be our final thing. Uh, Spurgeon showed how to work hard, often through pain. Again, let me repeat that. Spurgeon showed how to work hard, often through pain. Charles Spurgeon was incredibly hardworking. Before he was 20 years old, Spurgeon had preached more than 600 times. He often worked 18 hours a day. The famous explorer and missionary David Livingstone uh, marveled at Spurgeon's work ethic and how much he was able to get done. Listen, if David Livingstone is marveling at how much you can get done, you're doing something right. During his lifetime, it's estimated that Charles Spurgeon preached to 10 million people. Again, friends, this is before any kind of technology to extend your voice or reproduce it. Spurgeon was such a, a prolific writer that he is history's most widely read preacher, apart from the biblical preachers. Today, there's more available written by Charles Spurgeon than by any other Christian author, living or dead. He sometimes had 500 letters a week to answer. Listen, I complain if I have 10 emails to answer. And by expecting many invitations to speak, Spurgeon often preached 10 times in a week. He was a friend and an associate of Hudson Taylor, the well-known missionary to China, uh, with George Mueller, the orphanage founder. He was close to uh, Gladstone, the British prime minister, Lord Shaftesbury, the social reformer, D.L. Moody, the American evangelist and Christian leader, John Ruskin, the famous art critic and social reformer, and he was also a friend to William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. Charles Spurgeon accomplished so much, even though he was often ill, often depressed, and often under great spiritual heaviness and sense of responsibility. Spurgeon at one time said this. He said, quote, I confess it very quietly, but I have often wished that I had a little congregation, that I might watch over every soul in it. But now I am doomed to everlasting dissatisfaction with my work. For what am I among so many? I can only feel that I have not even begun to do the hundredth part of what needs to be done in a church such as this. Spurgeon pastored a big church. You could say one of the first mega churches. But friends, he lived with the burden of that and sometimes felt that he wished he had a little congregation to watch over. Spurgeon lived the last 20 years of his life in almost constant pain. He suffered from what we would call rheumatoid gout and then also kidney problems and many other ailments. His wife, Susanna, also suffered, and that was a burden for Charles Spurgeon. 
his wife Susanna, became an invalid at age 33 and could seldom attend her husband's services after that. Yet Spurgeon declined to slow down. Now, during his first significant illness in October of 1858, Spurgeon wrote to his congregation and his readers, he said this, quote, Do not attribute this illness to my having labored too hard for my master. For his dear sake, I would that I may be able to labor more. And later in another sermon, he said this, I look with pity upon people who say, do not preach so often, you will kill yourself. Oh my God, what would Paul have said to such a thing as that? Friends, make no doubt about it. Uh, Spurgeon was effectively used in one reason, because he knew how to work hard and often through pain. Now, don't get it wrong. Spurgeon knew how to take a break. He often would go to the south of France, to a place called Mentouin, Menton. And that's where he would recuperate in the warmer weather, in the, in the you know, more temperate climate. He knew how to take breaks, but he was a hard worker. All right, let me summarize these six points. Um, number one, I would say Spurgeon showed that God can use unexpected servants. Number two, Spurgeon showed the value of focus and the ability to think through a text for preaching and to really observe a text. Number three, Spurgeon showed how to preach to the common man and woman. Number four, Spurgeon showed how to tenaciously hold to beliefs without becoming a jerk. Number five, Spurgeon was loved and adored, but he was also hated, mocked, and attacked, and he figured out how to handle criticism. And then number six, Spurgeon showed how to work hard, often through pain. Friends, Charles Spurgeon had a remarkable impact and a life spent for Jesus Christ. He died in the year 1892 at only 57 years old, yet he accomplished a great amount for God's kingdom. I'm always touched by a story that I heard about Spurgeon in his later years when he was beset by gout and rheumatoid gout, arthritis of some type. He found it difficult to walk. And Spurgeon was making his way down a busy London street, people passing him by as he's walking slowly with a cane. And he comes to a corner and he looks across the street and the traffic's moving very fast. Now, not automobiles, of course, but horses, carriages, people moving back and forth very quickly across the street. And Spurgeon looks across the intersection and he says, I don't think I can make it. I, I got to turn around and go home. I, I, I can't make this. I can't cross this street. I, I don't have the, the ability. I, I'm not nimble enough. I'm not quick enough, strong enough to make it across. And as he sat there pondering his predicament, a blind man touched him on the arm and he said, sir, could you help me across the street? And Spurgeon immediately just responded, yes, I will. Spurgeon found himself able to do something for someone else, what he wouldn't necessarily do for his own sake. The opportunity to serve others for the sake of Jesus inspired him and prompted him to do something. Friend, I don't know what particular kind of preaching or teaching work that God has for you. Um, It could be in the eyes of the world and maybe even in the eyes of other believers, small or great. But the question comes to us, what will we do for the sake of Jesus? What will we do for the sake of those for whom Jesus died? Shouldn't this stir us both for Jesus, our Savior, and for the sake of those for whom Jesus died? Should we not say, Lord, I want to finish my race well. Whatever work you've given me in the proclaiming of your word, I I want to do it the best that I can. No, I don't want to neglect my family. No, I don't want to be sure. I want to give a Sabbath rest. 
I want to give the kind of breaks that you prescribe in scriptures and Spurgeon knew how to take. But in the time that I should be working, I want to be about my father's business. I think Spurgeon is a powerful illustration of that. With whatever time God gives us, let's use it in the best way we can for God's glory and by his grace. I hope this has been helpful for you. Charles Spurgeon, as a preacher, has a lot to teach us. I recommend to you, read Charles Spurgeon's sermons. I sure have read many of them. Uh, It's been a blessing to me. I hope it can be a blessing to you. 